I can do that. You can tell us about yourself? <laughs> no, I skipped that part and get right into this. Oh, yeah. Well, jump up on stage. I'll read it real, real quick here. Um, we're going to uh, move on to Dick Board. Dick is a semi-retired, uh, it's in quotes, semi-retired engineer inventor with a passion for energy efficiency. He played a key role for 25 years in Davis Energy Group's product development work and left that group to form the Western Cooling Efficiency Center in 2006. He retired in 2009 and later joined the Integrated Comfort to assist with emerging technology pro pro products. Excuse me. Uh, Please help me introduce Dick Bourne. Hey, hey Sam, you want to give me a, give me a pointer on the pointer here? Uh, that advances and that retracts. Okay. And that little dot up there is a laser if you want to use the pointer. A little dot. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. <clears throat> well, there's a lot of passion in this room today, and I didn't realize there was going to be so much, so I put that word in the intro that I sent on ahead. Um, and I think that passion is really important to going forward. It's been a thrill so far to see how many people are committed to doing the right thing here. And uh, sometimes that right thing is cost effective. And even when it isn't, it usually is the right thing for the long run. But I'm excited about being able to show you. Uh, actually, I have two separate presentations here because I was given a little more time in the original schedule. And what we're trying to decide here is whether I do one now and then everybody eats. That's probably the best idea. And then I either do the second one over lunch or right after we eat. But in the first one, I get to talk about my home. Several people have done that already. But uh, five, five and a half years ago, um, my wife and I, and we share the, the passion for energy efficiency, I think, that'll show up in this project, decided that we lived out in the suburbs long enough and we wanted to move to downtown Davis. I don't, how many of you have been to Davis? It's a pretty nice university community, and the downtown is really a vibrant place now, unlike 30 years ago. So we just found that we were spending more and more time downtown, riding our bikes downtown mostly. Um, Bruce, I've ridden as many miles as you have, by the way, because I was a bicycle commuter since 1971 and taken some long touring trips, too. Um, but anyway, we uh, decided we wanted to move downtown. We had built a very energy efficient house out in the suburbs of Davis 20 years before. Got quite a bit of publicity for it. It was pretty near net zero energy. It cost us about $3 a month to cool it in the summertime without compressors. It was cooler than our neighbors' houses. And so we, you know, we had learned some things that we wanted to uh, take downtown if we could. And as we looked around at what was available, there, there weren't very many choices. Um, but we got lucky and we found a piece of property a half a block from Central Park that has good open sky conditions, not too many big trees nearby, and was basically oriented east-west. It was a corner lot. And we found, fairly quickly found, three other senior couples who were interested in retire, retiring downtown like we were. And so we built a, a senior project called Parkview Place. And what I'm really emphasizing in what I'm presenting today is the geothermal aspect of it. There are a lot of really interesting and innovative aspects to this project, uh, not the least of which was the social experiment involved. Um, but I, I like the uh, title of this overall program, Creating ZNE Buildings with Off-the-Shelf Technologies, because what we did was take a technology that Davis Energy Group, where I was for so many years, developed in the late 90s and, and really put on the shelf, didn't do much with, which is this GeoHelix uh, ground, ground coupled heat pump technology. So um, now if I can advance, uh, this is our building. We've lived in it for a year and a half now, almost. Um, this isn't the most flattering picture of it, but uh, I've used this one because you'll see what was there before. And basically, I'm just giving you a list of what I'm gonna try to cover in this first half which I'm going to get through by 5 of 12, I hope. So uh, briefly, the social experiment aspect of it, which is about eight seniors coming together, pretty much, you know, uh, fixed in our ways and working together to, to build a building. And it's been very successful, I want to say. A little bit about the project. Then I'm going to talk about the energy systems, uh, the ways that we can integrate features in a building to really save energy and in enhance comfort, a little bit about the GeoHelix installation, and then I'll, I want to talk about costs and cost effectiveness because I think it's, uh, it's possible to build very 
cost-effective building. I should be pointing at that, I guess. Huh? Anyway, to begin with, it, it's been a senior social experiment. Um, this house was the Pena house, and the city of Davis, went, Narcissa Pena, who was the last of the Penas living in Northern California, uh, at least in Davis, in Davis area. If you've ever driven I-80 uh, from San Francisco to Sacramento, you go by the Pena Adobe. It, it's a historic um, spot near Vacaville. Um, that's the family that was so crucial in, in uh, developing uh, all of and occupying and, and farming uh, a lot of Northern California, or at least this stretch. Um, they had a, a Davis component, the last of the Peñas, Narcissa Peña, lived in this house her whole life in downtown Davis, corner of 4th and D, and she died in 2008. The property came up for sale, and the question was, is there historic value here? Should this become a museum? Well, the house had no foundations, and it couldn't be saved, but conventional developers stayed away from it. And so we, with our group, were able, were able to, to buy it, which we wouldn't have been able to if it had been an empty lot, probably. And we spent a long time uh, deciding how we were going to do this project, how to organize. We, we became a community apartment project because that um, organizational mode is one of those that allows you to carry your former um, property tax valuation forward so that you don't get zapped with the full price of the new place you're building. Um, it took us four and a half years to actually get the, the building built, and uh, the first occupants moved in, in, in uh, well, actually three of the four couples moved in before the end of 2013. We make all our decisions by consensus, which is a very interesting process, but I won't say more about that now. We don't have the time. Summary on the project, we had a major, we made a commitment to have this be a true net, ener net zero energy building from the beginning. We wanted it to be all electric because we couldn't figure out how to, how to push gas back into the pipeline. So we made that commitment. We wanted to use the geo-exchange heating because, as Paul has pointed out, you can reduce the size of the renewable system you need if you use maximum energy efficiency in the building. So we developed a very good building shell. I'm not going to talk too much about that today, though, but that was a real focus. We have uh, active solar water heating. We have a 11,000-gallon rainwater tank um, under, under the building, and we designed to be able to use the gray water to uh, improve the performance of the geo system in the boreholes. Well, we don't have that yet, but that's the other story I better not tell. We had this fancy chart made that shows all, this, all the systems in the building, and if you come up here really close, you still can't read the writing there, but <laughs> I just want to show that we have these various circles uh, defining the different systems in the building, and the biggest one is the building itself. So we really focused on passive solar design of the building and on radiant uh, heating and cooling. So all the heating and cooling, there's no forced air, all the heating and cooling in the building is from the floors. It's a very high quality building. It's a luxury building really with uh, very classy tile floors. We built the building for $180 a square foot though. Um, and the other circle that I, the other circle that I want to point to here is the, the geo system, which basically powers the, the um, heating and cooling of the building through the radiant floors. So that's enough about those circles. Um, this, for this, we have 7,600 square feet of occupied space in the building. This is the mechanical room. It's about the size of the furnace in a normal home. And if you put together the furnace and the and the outdoor, the, the furnace and the, and the condensing unit in a normal home, we our equipment occupies less space, and we're serving five apartments. We have the four owner-occupied apartments, and then we have a, a rental apartment on the on the first floor, which probably will house our caregiver within not too many years. But uh, the the geo exchange system, we have 14 working geo helix boreholes. They're 24 inch diameter, 22 foot deep. Inside each of those, there's a, a spiral with half inch HDPE tubing on about uh, six inch spacing all the way down to the bottom. We have two 40 KBT, KBTU, just under seven tons of water to water heat pump stacked. There are two units there. You're seeing one on top of the other. We don't have the superheaters in them. 
we use the, the upper heat pump as our auxiliary water heating source, and each of the each of the apartments has uh, uh, two thermostatically controlled zones in it. The water heating is just like another zone, but it can operate in heating mode all year. And so that's the geo system. Here's a the most attractive view of the building, and it's, we've gotten rave reviews really in town is from the street and you're seeing it really from the southeast corner here in this bird's eye view but it is a three-story building it's flat roof and part of our goal here was not to have the building be too tall because it's it's just about the same height as a couple of tall two-story buildings that are within a half block of it and uh, we you know we had many struggles getting through the planning process with this building despite the fact that it should be just what downtown urban areas are looking for today, but um, we did get through it. And you can see that on the roof, we have uh, flat PV arrays, two of them, uh, one on each side. Each of those is 32 sun power panels, and there's a separate inverter for each of those sides. And then you can see our silver thermal uh, three panel array tilted in the middle there. Um, and there's only 75 square feet of solar thermal, but um, you know, from uh, early February through almost the end of November, we have all the, the uh, hot water we need from those panels. And then we just have to supplement with the heat pump. Um, here's some shots of the uh, assembly of the Geo Helix. We built a, a jig at the Integrated Comfort Shop in Vacaville and, and rolled these things up there. The tubes are held together in a pattern with, with um, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Back with um, didn't go back with face-to-face uh, -face tape, basically, and uh, so you can see one of the tape strands being built there, and then they're pulled off the jig and they 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 ship in a small pack, uh, and you can see these bullseyes are where the drill is going to hit, the auger is going to hit there and drill the holes, and these are the um, completed geo helixes ready to go into the hole. And then here are three shots showing the we, – we put the first row along the uh, south side um, of the building. You know, you know, they were within five feet of the neighbor's fence. Um, and here's the auger that drilled those in the second phase. This was just a, a backhoe-type rig that could put a, an auger on it. We had a bucket on the front, 24-inch auger here, which went down 13 feet before lunch for all the holes, and then after lunch, he, he put this 18-inch section on top, which is just a spacer, and allowed him to, to take the 24-inch auger all the way down to the bottom. Here's the support rig. These are the original design that we developed at Davis Energy Group, which is a suspender design. I'll show you a little bit more of that in the second half of the presentation. And uh, so that's supporting it for backfill, and then the suspenders are taken loose after the, the sand fill is completed, and these are just some of the connecting tubes from bores that have already been completed down the line. So that's the suspender design. The last four coils, which we put along the east side, were done later after the uh, after the slab for the building was in place, and we used a much we, we had a driller come out from Sacramento who had a much bigger rig that could go he could he could auger a 40 foot deep hole with this thing, um, and here. By this time, we've gone to the uh, pre-stretch uh, design that we expect to market. So you can see these guys are all, there are three of them here anyway. I guess one is already in the hole at this point. Um, but these are stretched out, and they'll, they'll go in the hole next. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in the second part of the presentation here. But, but basically, this is just the first winter. We, we moved into the building in December, and the building was cold and we started, and it was a pretty cold month. And uh, we had the loops filled with water, but the and we had inlet water coming in at 55 at the start, and dropped to 45, and the, the uh, outlet from the heat pumps dropped to 32. And during that time, we were operating still with a COP that was pretty well up there. But by January, it was, a, it was cold and dry and, uh, you know, not having the ground wet, we had hoped that we would be uh, souping these up a little bit with gray water, and we could, weren't allowed to put our gray water into the ground. So uh, the, I had us add antifreeze to the system, and the 
outlet temperature from the heat pump fell to 26 degrees, and consequently the COP fell, but still that's a pretty high COP. By February it was coming up again, and by March we were back up almost to a COP of five. So very, very efficient operation. Since that time we've been through the uh, first full summer of cooling, and we uh, operated the system pre-peak. We never operated the heat pumps in the utility on peak period uh, during that uh, during last summer, and uh, we just pre-cooled. Uh, we have two-inch toppings, so it's wood frame construction, but we have our tubing in two-inch uh, gypcrete topping on the floors, and we would cool the, the apartments to 74. On the hottest days, they'd post up to 78 by 7 p.m., and then the heat pump was allowed to operate again. So some and real comfort. The cool floor is really, really valuable for, for comfort. Just as in the winter, the warm floor is really wonderful. This past winter was the driest on record. Uh, there was almost no water flowing into the boreholes. Our drain water from the roof goes into the boreholes as well, by the way, after it fills the rainwater tank. And uh, the coolest we had return water going in that I saw was 33. So we really didn't need the antifreeze that is still in there. Um, so uh, installed costs. Uh, our installed costs were actually lower than this because there, there was some sweat equity involved. So what I did was to take our costs and I added a 20% um, margin for extra for labor and then another 20% for a contractor margin. We used high density polyethylene instead of PEX for our floor tubing because the heat pumps are never going to get the water hot enough to exceed the rating on the HDPE, half inch HDPE, you can buy in quantity for under 15 cents a, a lineal foot. So we got our full radiant system, including the heat pumps, circulating pumps on both sides and manifolds with tubing on six inch center in for under $3 a square foot. We got it in for a lot less than that, by the way, because we, we actually got the tax credit applied for, for the ground loops and the radiant together. Our ground loops we got in for $1.12 a square foot, and our PV, this is, I, I didn't leave the credit in that we actually took because it's no longer available on these. Hopefully it'll come back, but the, there was a Federal uh, Recovery Act credit that applied to GEO uh, through 2013 or 14, I can't remember which. But I left the credit in because it's still there for PV, so we paid six forty seven dollars a square foot for our photovoltaic. Our total cost for these components was 1041. I conservatively estimated in this uh, cost chart that, that the conventional HVAC system would have been $4 a square foot. And this is how we came out. Uh, we generated 27,500 kilowatt hours from our PV system. We used in the building less than 23. We had a surplus of 4,600, which we kindly sold back to, to PG&E for <clears throat> four and a half cents a kilowatt hour. But it's reducing our meter charges for the seven meters that were enforced on us. Um, and so based on Title 24, our annual energy cost for the building would have been about 4,800. I took the, a 15 cent per kWh value for the credit for the excess PV, we need a Tesla, but nobody wants to buy it. Um, so our, whoops, sorry, pushed the wrong thing again, and I go back. So anyway, the, the bottom line is that we, um, we not only came out significantly net positive in our first year, but we have a, a payback that shows to be about 8.8 .8 years and that leaves out a lot of things. It didn't show any credit for not having to run any gas into the building at all. It doesn't show anything for the value of the increased value of the building for having these features, which is the you know the the uh, thing that's a little silly about all the simple payback calculations that we do with buildings is that we we neglect to consider the increase in value for the features that are being considered. We want them to go to to zero value at a certain time as though they don't uh, allow us to sell the property for a higher price because of their benefits. So anyway, um, uh, I'm going to save the second half. Yep. What do you think? I, I mean, the food's here. Yep. So, you know, I think we should all, 
you know, belly up to the food bar here, and I'm happy to start talking early because I know there's a constraint. The next speaker is at Cornell. We, we, we have Cornell. 20 minutes that we found, so okay. we'll, we'll be good. Great. And the next, for the next half, I'm going <clears> to <throat> put my necktie on because I'm more in sales mode for integrated oh, nice. comfort uh, to get people excited about Geo Helix. There we go. Great. Thanks, Dick. And we'll, we'll rejoin the That being said, lunch is served. Sponsors all around the walls. Feel free to talk to any and all of us, please. And uh, we'll rejoin in about, uh, about 20, 25 minutes. That's when we really uh, achieve some success is when we can get these technologies into production homes. So quickly, you're familiar, I think, with the traditional uh, ground exchange or alternatives. Oh, good. I should go by this quickly because it's just review. There's the, the deep bore vertical technology that's uh, commonly used and particularly valuable where there isn't so much land area. You, take advantage of deep earth instead of surface earth, and there are differences in performance there. And then the lower picture here shows the slinky approach that's uh, like what Bill did at his house, where you have the land available to, to do that. And then the directional drilling approach that Bruce mentioned and showed a little bit about with, the, I think, Ditchwich developed that technology originally. So those are the traditional alternatives. And Geo Helix is a little bit different. It was actually pioneered uh, the, the first version of it that I saw was done by a fellow named Larry Marciniak in Sacramento area, and he just, he, he built these rebar cages and wired HDPE tubing around them and sunk them into augered holes. Pretty laborious, but they worked pretty well. Uh, meanwhile, Davis Energy Group developed this suspender helix in the course of a major project that we had, and I think that might be where I met Paul originally, I'm not sure, but it goes back 16 years or so. Um, and we did a couple of projects with, with that, but uh, the second one, we did a total of 36 boreholes as that next, and I'm calling that Geo Helix 1. Uh, it was the suspender design. It was used on a major uh, multifamily project on the UC Davis campus, but right early on when the auger went into the ground, it hit a, an underground stream bed. <laughs> And one of the constraints is you have to have soil that will hold together so you can you can drill a hole of a given diameter and not have the size just cave in on it. And that's what happened there. So that's pretty much when it went on the shelf. By the way, I just a uh, funny note is that uh, when I went did a patent search recently, someone in Italy patented our suspender design that we had demonstrated and documented for the Energy Commission eight years earlier, and it got a patent in Italy. So. Good for them. And this is basically how it worked. Um, you would have that pre-assembled helix, like the one I showed, and then you would, uh, so it's in kind of a tight pack, and then you put, after you auger the hole, you put this frame on top and connect the, uh, the suspenders for the, the helix to that frame, and then cut the cords, and whoop, it goes to the bottom. Well, almost to the bottom, and that's one of the problems with the suspender design is that it doesn't always hit the bottom, and then when you backfill on it, you have a lot of, of stress on the tubes because it's all, all hanging from that top. So uh, based on, and as I, I think I said about our project, the first two boreholes that we put in, we didn't remember the backfill protocol well enough, and we damaged them. So of our first 12, we only have 10 working. And by the way, we on our project, we have uh, 14 working boreholes for seven tons of heat pump. So it's two coils per ton. So um, anyway, the, again, the suspenders, uh, which in these original ones there were four um, at quarter points, were uh, uh, taped face-to-face. That, so they do a really good job of keeping the tube in, in place. That's the advantage of having so much adhesive in there. So um, the second concept that we're using now, uh, which we feel is really marketable, assembles them the same way, but it includes some clips at the top and about every four feet along the side of the spiral that a piece that a 20-foot long half-inch PVC tube fits into and stretches the thing to full length 
before you put it in the hole. And then when you drop it into the hole, it hits bottom. And as long as you're backfilling through a, a section of chain link fence or, or some suitable screen so that you don't have big chunks falling on it, then you can backfill and, and uh, sand is best because it compacts so quickly. But um, you can, as long as you have that grade on top, you won't damage the, the helix. I think, uh, and, and so these are uh, very similar dimensional characteristics to what, uh, except that those um, geohelix ones, those were um, in three foot diameter holes. We sharpened our pencils a little and figured that figured out that the two foot diameter hole is a lot more economical in terms of uh, drilling them and filling them and probably that um, the difference in the amount of earth that you capture in the middle of the cylinder is not so great. It's mostly, you're mostly trying to make contact with the further away ground. So I think that was a, a good decision on our part. But these can, by the way, this configuration, unlike the, the suspender, can also be placed in horizontal trenches and you get much more efficient use of the tubing than you do with slinkies because you don't have the, the interference. And I'm going to mention interference a little bit more later on, but I'm talking about thermal interference where you have tubes next to tubes. The problem with conventional vertical bores, by the way, because you may go 200 foot deep, but in the top 50 feet, you have your down tube and your up tube within a few inches of each other, and you're transferring heat directly from one to the other, and it's self-defeating. So what you'd like to do is have the water proceed continuously through the tube in a way that it's not very in very close contact with the down tube. That's just from the thermal standpoint. Also, there's, well, I, I'll get into some of this in pros and cons, and I better watch the time. Um, the application range, the most important thing limiting us is that you have to have soil that can be augered. So if you're in rock or big gravel, forget it. Um, looking at the difference between, uh, well, I, I guess I should just say that the characteristics of the geohelix are somewhere between the horizontal and the deep bore. The deep bore has the advantage that you're getting down usually into the water table um, and you're getting down there to deep earth where the temperatures presumably are, are more stable. But on the other hand, you don't have access to the recovery characteristic that the surface earth gives you. So if you're in a heating dominated or a cooling dominated situation, instead of a balanced situation, there are data that show that over time you swing the clump of earth that you're, that you've captured, uh, in a direction and it just keeps going and you, you don't have the, you know, long-term annual ground temperature working for you anymore. If you're heating only, it's cooler and so you're losing efficiency. Um, but compared to horizontal, you also capture more earth because you're, you know, you're basically taking advantage of the top 30 feet or so of the ground instead of the, the top 10 feet or so. <clears throat> but like the horizontals, you have the advantage of smaller excavation equipment. I don't think you rival the uh, equipment advantage that you have, though, with directional drilling, where you can be out in the street effectively and, and go in. And if you don't have to have be in the backyard, too, um, that's, that's a pretty neat option, and maybe it's as good or better an option for a retrofit. Anyway, the real pros of the Geo Helix um, are that you have less interference. This is, this is interference here, okay? This guy's pushing this ball uphill, and this guy's not helping. He's resisting, and that's what I mean by interference, where you have tubes too close to tubes, and so you're, you're losing the value of, of that part of your heat exchanger. The other thing that we do is use smaller tubing, which is more conductive, more shorter runs in parallel, therefore higher velocity flow in the tubing, and that contributes to better heat transfer. We also space them closer. We're recommending eight, eight foot spacing or so, and the deep bores you usually put on 20 foot spacing. So we're not asking heat to travel from as far away to get to our heat exchanger. Lower cost faster installation is a, a main attractive feature of the geo helix. Also, we're above the, some of the barriers in the ground that, um, you know, water agencies are worried about penetrating. So if you can stay ab above that 25 foot level, you're less likely to allow surface contaminants to flow down through 
your hole and into the into the deep ground where it can contaminate the long-term water sources. And also, it's it's uh, adaptable to retrofits in smaller sites, much more so than the deep bores. <clears throat> the biggest con is is really the rocky ground, but also you have less access less access to the deep earth, which if it's a balanced load situation, may be a loss. We do see lots of ways to get them wet, even though our dry weather lately has not contributed. But another major disadvantage for people considering using it now is it's new. Uh, we don't have a lot of performance data, but we're pretty confident based on our experience so far with our project and on the, the two completed projects from last time around that it's, uh, it, it performs well compared to the alternatives. Rules of thumb that, that there was some fairly detailed testing done back in the 1999 era on Geohelix 1, and the conclusion was that one 20 foot deep bore was uh, performed equivalently to 87 feet of deep bore. So we have a lot more pipe, of course, in contact with Earth in our 20 feet. And so at this point, for projects that are coming to us now, we're just to be conservative, we're recommending two and a half bores per ton. As I said at our house, we have two bores per ton. It's working fine. We'd rather err on, this, on the side of, uh, you know, conservatism and, and uh, higher performance right now. Um, spacing, we've got about 250 feet of, of half-inch HTPE tube per coil, and we're recommending spacing the boreholes at eight to nine feet. Um, some of the synergies, keeping boreholes wet, if you can send storm drainage and gray water in there, that's going to improve performance. One of our synergies is combination with radiant floors, but this is a synergy that's there for all geo systems. If you, you have a, a smaller temperature range across the heat pump cycle, if you are delivering through radiant tubing than you do through forced air, so uh, you just get better efficiency that way. We are, we have excess solar heat from our water heating much of the year, and we're able to discharge that into our borehole field. And since we're, um, we're heating dominated, that's beneficial for us. That's the Honda house that Michael's going to talk about. So that's the other job that's been done recently with uh, our Geo Helix. Looking at equipment, uh, I think you want to, just, if you're doing a small job, you want a piece of equipment like this. If you're doing a large job, you want a, a big rig like the one that I showed doing the four east bores at our project. It can go faster and have a separate, um, a separate piece of excavating equipment that's going to do the, the trenching and filling to connect the, the holes. Uh, target cost per ton, I, I don't want to take more time, but I think this, these are pretty good um, costs for a near-term project where you've got 100 boreholes in a new tract home development, I think, uh, you know, $700 a ton range is possible if you're taking a less conservative approach and putting in two boreholes per ton. Otherwise, if, if you do two and a half, you're, you know, a little bit more than that. So the status of the GeoHelix as a product, they're available now. They're in the field performing well. I'd say we're on a good learning curve. The economics are really promising, and I think it provides a really attractive way to get um, to cost-effective true net zero energy in the relatively near future. So I'm happy to take questions if there's time. Any questions, both online? Uh, Bill, let's take yours while we're checking you online. the nature of the sand if you would prefer any sand is good. I mean, there's ver there are very few sands. The advantage of sand is uh, there are multiple advantages actually. I mean, it's the it's the least dangerous for damaging tubing in the backfill process. It's uh, a wonderful filter. So, in the face of any local agencies who are concerned about surface contaminants getting down through your borehole into the deeper earth. We're not going that deep, first of all, but second of all, the sand is a filter. And uh, it compacts quickly. So I think if you use uh, just cuttings from the hole and make sure that you put them back in through a grate so that they don't damage the, the helix, what you're going to find typically is if you don't do something to try to, uh, something physical to compact it, within a year, you're probably going to have a foot-deep divot because there's going to be that much 
settlement. Whereas either sand or a mix, a good mix of sand and cuttings will give you very little long-term settlement in that in that borehole. Have you ever used some uh, high volumes of water on filling the sand to really kind of slurry it in? We haven't we haven't done that. I can see some some advantage to that. Uh, probably not in our current drought conditions, but <laughs> water is so precious. But it it might be valuable. We haven't found a need for it, but it's it it could uh, streamline backfilling. Yes. Jimmy, uh, well, unfortunately, um, you know, there hasn't been a lot of data. The, the, the big project that was done, where I mentioned that we hit an underground stream bed, basically, and there was a lot of gravel. Um, that project, we did manage to get that. There were 27 boreholes in that for that one building, and it's been operating fine since 1999. So, uh, and it's U UCD uh, campus. I don't know how r routinely it's been occupied in the summer, so I can't speak to the load balance. Our building hasn't been finished long enough to speak to it much either, except that we are clearly heating dominated, and um, we've had higher ground temperatures this winter than we had in the first winter when we had that big early drawdown. So, time will tell. Has this been used for cooling? Yes, I mean, we did, we have used it for cooling. In all the projects that it's been installed in so far, it's been, which is four, it's been used reversibly for heating and cooling. But it's, the, the question is, what's the balance, what's the annual balance? And, not the, the monitoring probably hasn't been sophisticated enough to let us answer that. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you.